Mm -hmm. so, welcome everyone uh, to today's seminar. Uh, this is the event that is organized by uh, Students for Sustainability or S Square, and we invite uh, faculty members uh, inside or uh, from outside of house to talk about topics around sustainability or otherwise ability of us as a society to exist uh, constantly. So, and today's speaker is um, Professor Carlos Santamarino. Uh, Dr. Carlos uh, uh, is a professor and uh, associate director of Ali Al Naimi uh, Petroleum Engineering Research Center in Faust. He graduated from National University of Cordoba and continued his uh, education in the uh, University of Maryland and uh, Purdue. And also before joining Faust, he worked um, in uh, different North American universities, such as uh, um, New York uh, Polytechnic University, uh, University of Waterloo, and Georgia Tech. Uh, his research group here in Faust works on development in field of energy geotechnology and uh, works on problems such as uh, resource recovery, energy, and waste storage. And uh, this is uh, also our topic today, is uh, CO2 geological storage. Uh, and uh, we hope to learn and enrich uh, from a professor today uh, around this topic, which seems to be uh, kind of uh, capturing the minds of uh, many people who is caring about the environment and climate change. And uh, if you have uh, any questions or comments, uh, please leave them in the Q&A or uh, uh, chat box or just raise your hand in the session when we will have a discussion. So please, uh, professor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, you, Bob, and thank you all for joining us today. I didn't expect such a large audience, uh, and so I am very pleased to see the interest on the geological storage of CO2 in this community. The, um, I was planning to go through the first few slides uh, faster, however, uh, um, based on the characteristics of the audience that you all described to me, probably I should uh, dwell more on those slides. Uh, so, so this is where the problem starts. The problem starts that, uh, that there is a, such a strong correlation between power consumption per person and availability of water, access to water, the life expectancy, infant mortality rate, the ability to go to school, that stands for mean years of schooling, of course, access to electrification and the direct relationship with income. And so clearly, uh, whether it is a causal, the, the, the causality is not clear which is the cause and which is the effect, but clearly all these indices of our quality of life are intimately related to power consumption. Now, uh, if we add up the current power consumption, it is at the, in the order of 18 terawatts. That is a humongous number, and we will try to decipher it somehow, but uh, imagine that a large uh, nuclear power plant would be one gigawatt, so, so this is 18,000 of the largest nuclear power plants, and then we have, we have built only about 500 of those. Each data point here shows the quality of life and the mean power consumption per capita for every single country in the world. We've been tracking this uh, relationship between quality of life and power consumption for the last two decades. And it is clear that countries are improving their quality of life, but they are doing it at the expense of increasing power consumption. In fact, uh, except for, for a few exceptions here, all countries are pretty much following the overall trend that you see in this picture. Increased quality of life at the, at the expense of increased power consumption. So now we have a problem because there is a compounded effect between increasing population, which is probably we are expecting another 2 billion uh, individuals on, on the earth uh, within this generation, with, within the next 25 years uh, horizon that I'm showing in this slide. But the increase in population may be about 25% of current um, population. However, the energy consumption will increase by 50%. And once again, the reason is because of this compounded effect that is not only the population is increasing, but also the quality of life is increasing at the expense of increased power consumption. 
And that is all perfectly fine until so I am running ahead of myself. So let me suggest here, because I think that the, uh, this team in the, with the mentality of sustainability is so critical for the world today and for generations to come. What would it take to develop a sustainable energy system? Well, we do want to improve quality of life, particularly for the underdeveloped world, that being in Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America. I mean, it's a human thing to do, right? We want them to have better quality of life. Imagine, I went through the first slide very fast, but in many of those countries, life expectancy is less than 45 years. I mean, this is not acceptable in today's world. So we want to promote increased quality of life, but we have to reduce power consumption. Uh, at current rates and with the energy sources that we have, this is truly unsustainable. So as we move towards a sustainable energy system, we have to figure out the complex situation where we have to reduce power consumption, but improve quality of life in the underdeveloped world. This is our challenge today. And we are at the premier university, the intellectual institution in the world. We should embrace this challenge wholeheartedly. So now we have to wonder what are the sources that we use for it to support our energy demands. Well, 85% worldwide is still fossil fuels, based meaning petroleum, coal, and gas. And now I come from the geosciences, engineering and geosciences. So we also have to ask, okay, well, where do these come from? Uh, well, uh, let's take a look at the origin of the earth, which is about four and a half billion years old. And at the beginning, it was abiotic. Life somehow, this is the greatest miracle, appears probably in three and a half, 3.8 billion years ago. And now, up to that point, the atmosphere was primarily a CO2 atmosphere, a reducing atmosphere. However, as bioactivity begins to take place, it uses the energy from the sun to capture the CO2 and to release oxygen. And these microorganisms, which are so little but so many, through time, managed to reverse our atmosphere from being a reducing atmosphere to an oxidizing atmosphere. And in fact, that is captured in the historical geological record and oxides, for example, appear in, in the middle of this map because by then the atmosphere had changed. And we begin capturing that CO2 and that CO2 gets captured in many different ways. One of them is in carbonates. Yeah, in calcium CO3. Yeah? Part of the CO2 gets captured there, part of it gets captured in organic matter. Now the organic matter gets buried and it takes about almost 1 billion years, but let's say 700, 500 million years to accumulate that organic matter in the subsurface. That eventually got cooked and it became petroleum, coal, and gas. It took about 500 or more million years to, for this to happen. Now look at the little line, the little yellow line here at the end of the, of the map. And I know that you are, all of you very familiar with this, but let me, let me highlight here. What I'm trying to highlight is the contrast between time scales, and I will also show you the spatial scales. So once again, 500 million years to make it simple, to accumulate all that organic matter. And now we expand that by 2 million times. And that line becomes this little Gaussian hump here. It started about 200 years ago, just 200 years, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And it will end more or less within the next 200 years. This is the era of fossil fuels, this yellow one. Very short, less than 400 years. The surprising thing is that it took so long to accumulate the organic matter, and it's taking us so little to burn it. And as we do so, we take that 
carbon molecules in hydrocarbons, for example, and we burn it, that means that we oxidize it and we release the CO2 into the atmosphere. And what is surprising is that Google Earth makes this beautiful image of the Earth. However, the thickness of the atmosphere is less than 10 kilometers. We systematically fly over without coronavirus when we have a chance to fly. We fly over about 80% of the atmosphere. And so the thickness of the atmosphere is thinner than the line that I just put on the screen. And that is the problem because that very, very thin shell is the one that creates the thermal balance between radiated heat and the heat that gets radiated back out. And that is uh, the effect of uh, global warming, climate change. Uh, all that is related to that thin layer where we are pumping all the CO2 back. And so the, what we are trying to pursue today is the idea of capturing the CO2 before it gets released to the atmosphere or even from the atmosphere, even though it is very diluted, and to capture it and to inject it back into the ground. And this is the concept of carbon geological storage. And so this opens the door to what now is becoming quite uh, uh, an important concept here in the kingdom, which is a concept of a circular carbon economy, where we do use uh, uh, buried resources, but then we put back uh, the carbon in the subsurface or we do something with it. So what is the size of the problem? Let me make it very simple, folks. This is an equation worth re remembering. The size of the worldwide economy is about 80 tera dollars per year. Tera meaning 10 to the 12. We consume about 160 tera kilowatt hours of energy. And if you realize that 85% of that is coming from fossil fuels and you see how much CO2 you produce from burning fossil fuels, you are, we are releasing 40 tera kilograms of CO2. You tend to hear this one in tons, but I like the TTT here because then they cancel out and I can make it even simpler. For every dollar in the economy, it took about two kilowatt hours of embedded energy to produce it. And we release about 0.5 kilograms of CO2. This has huge implications, folks, because if you buy a shirt for $10, you're effectively, you have effectively consumed 20 kilowatt hours throughout the economical cycle and release five kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere which, by the way, is much better than buying a shirt for $40. There is such a direct relationship between dollars, energy, and release CO2 that sometimes we don't need to make the story too complex. We just need to reverse to this relationship to understand the world situation today. So there is an inherent link between these three, the economy, the energy, and the uh, emitted CO2. As you realize, there is a T in each one of them, so we do have a Tera problem, and we really need Tera solutions. This is, it is great to pick up the plastic bags wherever we go. Please, let's do it, and let's use less. But really, we're here. We have to think at the huge scale. It's more than just our local instantaneous scale today. And then as a geoscience and engineer, my challenge is to say, how can I contribute to this problem? So this is the concept of circular carbon economy. And this is an, initial, uh, an initiative taking place at CAOS today. Very exciting, uh, coming from, from the, the leadership in the kingdom and being led, led by Jorge Gascon. And this is the contribution of the group that uh, is in the thrust of the geosciences and geoengineering. And the idea is how can we recover uh, oil more effectively using CO2 as an enhancer of recovery, how to capture it and store it underground, 
And then there are other parts, for example, can we use the geothermal energy or can we store in the subsurface solar and wind energy when we have an excess of it at certain times of the day and the possibility of contributing to nuclear waste storage. This is an important challenge. Today we will try to see part of those elements on the left. And I realize that I'm going too slow, so I'm going to begin accelerating the pace. Let me just say that there is very limited amount of CO2 injected here in the kingdom, uh, still today, part for the CO2 um, enhanced soil recovery and uh, great opportunities as well as challenges as we look forward. So what are the underlying concepts for CO2 geological storage? Well, we already know how much we want to store. Probably we don't want to store all of it, but we want to store a good part of it. How long should we store it for? Because for nuclear waste, now we're thinking about 100,000 years. What about for CO2? At the beginning, people used to have a similar expectation, but later on, people are saying, look, within uh, hundreds of, a couple of hundreds of years, we should have been completely away from fossil fuels. And so by then, uh, uh, some CO2 into the atmosphere is okay if it is released. So some, now people are shortening that time scale. We don't need to have the same constraints as we have for nuclear waste. And what are the geoprocesses involved? And if seals are going to leak, how can we anticipate it, seal them, etc.? I will try to answer some of those questions today. So these are the different trapping mechanisms that we have been exploring in the discipline of CO2 geological storage. One is the possibility of storing it as, as gas and probably use it for, for, for some applications with, uh, um, for energy storage in the context of um, brine uh, pressurization, etc. This is limited. In most cases, it will be as a, it's unlikely that it will be as a gas. It is a low confinement. It will be supercritical. I will say more about supercritical state. That is probably the most common case, and that will be to displace water in saline aquifers that are considered useless for all other purposes, deep in the under, underground, to inject it into depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. There are two concepts here. One is to say, if the oil didn't leak and it was still stored, so the seals should be okay. That is not completely correct, because as you will see, supercritical CO2 has very low viscosity. And number two, probably most oil that was ever created in those 500 million years leaked before we came to start producing it. So reservoirs are fairly leaky in general. And uh, the other one is to use it for enhanced oil recovery. Can we store it in liquid form? If we pressurize a gas a lot, it becomes a liquid. And so, but that means it has to be under high pressure and typically low temperature. So that means that is possible. In fact, there are pools of CO2 near volcanoes in the Pacific Ocean. And so the CO2, liquid CO2 sits uh, filling dips in the bottom of the ocean. The concern is that water will be continuously leaking it and uh, there will be mutual diffusion and eventually will lead to acidification and uh, it will leak out. Um, what about dissolve? There is a huge mass in the ocean. We can dissolve it once again. Acidification is a major issue and uh, it can dissolve in hydrocarbons and that is what is used primarily for enhanced soil recovery. It can also be adsorbed, for example, adsorbed on coal, in, in coal seams that are not uh, producible. And it can also be stored as a solid and precipitated minerals. It could be used to replace the CH4 in methane hydrates for CO2, wherever hydrates are available, not around the kingdom. And also for uh, coal bed methane recovery by a similar substitution. So to summarize here, here you have the different phases that you can find CO2, gas, supercritical liquid, and not as solid CO2, but in a solid matrix. Now, each of these probably has different 
securities that we have going to lock it for a long time, the more uh, the more uh, uh, the higher the fugacity, the higher its tendency to escape, the more difficult it is to keep it trapped. And so, uh, structural and, and stratigraphic trapping, like for example, here you have an anticline and then it accumulates because of buoyancy, is a possibility, but it will always be there looking for escape. Residual trapping, when it gets trapped in smaller pores by capillarity, solubility, when it gets dissolved in water, and mineral trapping have different residency times, let's say. The, the ideal one would be to just lock it in place. Like the way we do in constructions, for example, the, the, the Romans used to use uh, cook calcium carbonate to make lime, uh, uh, oxygen, uh, CO, uh, uh, calcium oxide. That one, when you mix it with water, it forms calcium hydroxide. And that is what you mix with sand to make mortar to put one brick on top of each other. Now, with time, CO2 goes in into that hydrated um, calcium oxide, calcium hydroxide, and releases the water and traps the CO2, regenerating calcium carbonate. That is typical masonry from the Romans until today. Now we use also Portland cement. So that is the idea of mineralization. And the increased security is towards the solid component. So if we look back at all the situations that have been tested, explored, prototyped, and actually implemented in, in, in for industrial applications, they fall in fairly narrow bands. This is injection in saline aquifers. There are 20, 30 points from behind these cases. These are applications for enhanced uh, oil recovery, the, the grayish area. This is coal bed methane. It's typically in this transition, in this region. And this is hydrates. But now let me explain what this plot is. This is pressure versus temperature. This, uh, this is the phase diagram of CO2. Here is gas at low pressure and high temperatures. Most likely that you're going to find it as a gas. As you begin pressurizing, let's say that we are here at, at, at 20 degrees Celsius. As we begin pressurizing it at about, what, eight megapascals, it becomes a liquid. If it will really go way, way, way up there, uh, whatever, 500, 600 megapascals, it could actually become a solid. The surprising thing is that there is a point in this phase diagram that now you go through at the given pressure, at the given temperature, you, you begin increasing the pressure and you never see liquid to solid transformation. In fact, if you are in a chamber, if you are in this regime at 20 degrees Celsius and you begin pressurizing, then you begin to see liquid accumulating and rising. You never see that at this temperature because it's super critical. There is no phase boundary anymore. And that is the condition that prevails in under onshore applications. Because onshore, you pick up the geothermal gradient and the earth gets hotter and hotter as we build up pressure and in the subsurface. So the subsurface is typically uh, super critical. If you are offshore, the temperature at the bottom of the ocean, not in the Red Sea, but the temperature at the bottom of the ocean is typically around three, four degrees. And so it is very common to find applications or possibilities, like I mentioned earlier, of liquid CO2 underneath the oceans. So this would be onshore at uh, four degrees. Uh, I should know this number by heart, but I don't. And so this is about uh, four or five megapascals, which means probably five or 600 meters of water, you go into liquid. The interesting thing here is that at those temperatures and pressures, water gets locked in around CO2 molecules or methane molecules and form cages. These are called hydrates, which is another way of trapping CO2. I will say something more about this later. Now, some applications where we inject CO2 with water in, with the idea of dissolving some minerals to re-precipitate new minerals, this is the concept of mineralization, are also operating in this regime. Let me give you examples. So, now we can begin putting together some of these trends and um, this is the increase in pressure with depth 
let's say zero water depth or the surface of the earth here. Let's say that we have an ocean which is 500 meters deep, so the temperature decreases and then it increases again when we hit the earth, the, 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 the subsurface, because of the geothermal gradient, the same geothermal is here if we are onshore. What happens with the water density doesn't change much, let's say 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, a ton per cubic meter, but CO2 changes dramatically. Here is a gas, here it begins really to increase, go, going towards liquid CO2, but we decided to put the seabed here, now the geothermal gradient keeps it supercritical. Now, um, if it was uh, onshore, it would be gas, 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 supercritical, supercritical. Now, the viscosity also changes quite significantly, folks. And uh, this is going to affect the interaction between fluids because they are so intimately related to viscosity. But in all these applications, viscosity remains orders of magnitude lower than the viscosity of water. This is for those of you who like geophysics. This is to remind you that the p-weight velocity of CO2 is very low in gas it jumps across the phase boundary when it becomes liquid. Liquids tend to be relatively incompressible. However, the bulk stiffness of CO2 is four, six orders of magnitude, six, four to six times lower than the bulk stiffness of water. So uh, when you replace, when you push CO2 into the formation and you displace water, you should expect your P wave velocities to decrease significantly, allowing us for geophysical monitoring. Enough of that. So now we begin to get into the reservoir, uh, but I have to tell you one more thing. Let's say that we are in supercritical CO2. You already saw that the density is quite low compared to the density of water or brine. This is in a brine field uh, uh, layer. It's significantly lower. That means that when we inject the CO2, it's eventually going to find its way up and it's going to go off by buoyancy, buoyancy up. And folks, let me begin anticipating the large number of things that happen here. First of all, how far it will spread if the cap rock was horizontal. We don't want that. There is no geometric trapping. It will spread like a pancake. Eh? It will only be restrained by capillarity on the edges here. We can compute that height very easily, <coughs> depending on the pore size. When the CO2 goes in, CO2 can dissolve lots of water. In other words, the water evaporates into the CO2. So it will evaporate the water that was here before and because it was brine, salt will precipitate. That's not good because it may begin clogging porosity here. Second, because of buoyancy, now there is a mismatch in pressures across the cap rock. And that pressure difference, that capillary pressure caused by the buoyancy of the CO2 has to be held by the cap rock. It cannot invade. It has to work like a raincoat. That is the concept. We'll do some calculations. So now let's take a look at viscosity because you hear about viscosity and you don't get much feeling. The first one was water, light oil. This is real time. This is medium density oil. And the last one is already flowing. This is heavy oil, like for example in the Orinoco or in Canada. That's heavy oil and heavier than that as well. And then the far, far right is the longest running experiment in, in, in history. Actually it's running and there is a, that drop will fall in nine years. So there is a dramatic change in viscosity. Uh, across these fluids and this is the important thing that if you look at permeability it's inversely proportional to viscosity so when viscosity changes in supercritical is here uh, 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 three four five six orders of magnitude so does the permeability this will have huge implications when we try to store this very low viscosity fluid now, here I injected a droplet of CO2 in water with a universal color in pH indicator. And so you saw this an accelerated movie. Sorry, this is going too fast, so we'll stop it. You saw that uh, as time passed by, 
the, the water droplet contracted and the halo around the water droplet increased. This is the CO2 dissolving into the water, forming carbonic acid, bringing the pH down, at this pressure probably only to pH 5 or 4, and that front diffusing out, and you can compute the diffusion rate and based on the degree of saturation based on this color scheme. Now this water now has water and has CO2 in the pores. So now the mixture of water with CO2 is heavier. So this is a water bath with a CO2 atmosphere at the top. Once again, with a color indicator, pH indicator. As we let time pass by, CO2 dissolves in the water. The water gets heavy and it begins forming these teardrops and convective currents that are going to keep this going and going and going until the water becomes saturated in CO2. This is going to happen in the formation, in the reservoir. Now, if we inject uh, CO2 acidified water into this uh, packing, these are glass beads, coarse and fine glass beads, we're injecting it, and this, is, this lasts a long time, but it's a, it's a high speed uh, display. You see how the diffusion front of the pH acidification is taking place as, as the CO2 begins invading and the invasion is far, far from homogeneous. By the way, these are perfectly homogeneous glass beads, but even optically you can detect how difficult it is to make them homogeneous. And now it's reaching the cap rock, the seal rock, which is much finer glass beads. It, it, it created a fracture along this interface and now it breaks through the cap rock and it keeps looking through the cap rock where the weakest points are, invading, displacing, fracturing, diffusing, acidifying, and then eventually, all of a sudden, there will be a breakthrough and it will appear at the surface. And that's the concern of CO2 storage. How long will it stay? Is it the fast bargain? This is, I'm going to go briefly through a few more slides of the physics, but let me just, you all know that, that the more pressure you put, the more you can dissolve the gas into a liquid in general, and, uh, and, and that also depends on the salinity already on the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the liquid itself, because if the water is already entertained with lots of salt, it cannot take much more CO2 into it, but CO2 goes in and fits into the voids of it between the water molecules. So overall, solubility increases with pressure, and then pH, and as that happens, the pH goes down. For example, at 40 megapascals, probably here your pH is going to be in the order of two and a half. And as pH goes down, now you begin to control the reaction rates and the solubility of the minerals. And so what is happening, folks? We are, we, this is a reservoir at the droplet scale. You're looking at a whole reservoir in a droplet. What you see is a water droplet on top of a calcite crystal surrounded by supercritical CO2. And then time-lapse photography. We wait and we wait and two things are happening. First of all, the water, CO2, is dissolving into the water. The water is becoming acid. Because the water is acid, calcite doesn't like it and calcite begins dissolving into the water. In the meantime, water, the water droplet begins evaporating, dissolving into the CO2. So you see the volume decreasing. But as the volume decreases, now what happened with the calcite that was dissolved, that got dissolved? Well, then the calcite has to re-precipitate. And now you go back and you look at the surface under the SEM, and this, here you see the re-precipitated calcite on the calcite crystal. This is a reservoir at the droplet scale. So now we go back and we look at the reservoir. So what is going on? Because of viscosity differences, there will be viscous fingering. Eh? The CO2 likes to invade much faster than the water can move out, and so it will just invade forming fingers. 
but it is lighter, so it will eventually climb to the top and create buoyancy that has to be restrained, restrained by capillarity. And some diffusion is going to take place into the seal rock and to, into the cap rock, the seal layer, and into the formation. Now you saw how it was diffusing in the, in the glass beads uh, experiment. The pH is going to decrease, which is going to dissolve the minerals. I'm going to show you that causes mineral contraction and changes in the state of stress. But then remember that that, CO, that uh, water with CO2 now gets heavy and that will, is going to create the teardrops and this is going to create convection. And as it comes down, the pH begins once again regaining and it's beginning to drop minerals. So we're going to drop minerals here, dissolve them here and sustain this with convection and who knows what is going to happen. This is going to settle. It may fracture the cap rock. So the immersion phenomena, what we do not know that we don't know is really scary when the systems are so complex. I will say a couple of thoughts about uh, the permeability because you saw the importance of, excuse me, capillarity because we have these two fluids that are, they dissolve into each other but are immiscible in the sense that they do have interfacial tension between them. And so what about the interfacial tension? Now we're looking inside the air at the droplet and as we begin increasing the pressure of the CO2, this is a water droplet on some, probably this is a Teflon substrate. Uh, very high contact angles and, and, and so as I begin, this is gas CO2, I begin increasing, it becomes super critical, keep increasing, oh, excuse me, gas, 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 I am outside the, 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 the super critical state and now it becomes liquid. So now I have liquid CO2 and liquid water and look how rounded the droplet has become, so it can become tight. That means that the surface tension has uh, uh, uh -huh. Uh, it has gone in the opposite direction that I have just described. And so here is the evolution of uh, the, 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 when you infer, when you do the proper calculation with Laplace's equation in parametric form, now you can defer, infer the interfacial tension. And the interfacial tension started like water and air, 72 millinewtons per meter. But then as the gas gets denser and denser and denser, there is better balancing between the van der Waals interactions in the droplet and the gas, and the interfacial tension decreases until we go through the gas-liquid transformation and then phase transition, and then it becomes more or less stable at about 25, 30 millinewtons per meter. This will control invasion percolation patterns the contact angle changes as well as you saw it in the case of the droplet. Much more complex whether it was wetting or not wetting, we leave it there. So folks, now I'm going to invade with the CO2 the formation either for enhanced soil recovery or to displace the brine. I want to increase the efficiency because if I don't have good displacement efficiency, I'm going to require much, much larger volume. And so how is that going to happen? Because the invasion depends on two parameters, on the relative viscosities, remember the capillary fingering and the viscous fingering that we were talking about, depends on the, on the, uh, on the uh, relative viscosities, particularly the viscous, viscous fingering here. And I would like to have a stable displacement, not that I invade with fingers, but I push like a bulldozer the other fluid out. And so I want to move, these are typical CO2 sequestration under supercritical conditions you know, onshore. And I would like to move these conditions from here to here. So I have few degrees of freedom. I can either change the viscosity with some form of foaming or viscosifier, or I can change the interfacial tension and the contact angle. And uh, if we do that, which we can do with surfactants, I'm going to accelerate the pace. Um, indeed we, uh, we may attain very good displacement efficiencies in a small laboratory scales. The problem is the surfactants love the mineral surface, they get stuck on the, on the walls of the, of the rock, of the storage reservoir, and then it's more difficult to push the surfactants to the interface where you need it. 
The next two set of slides talk about dissolution and precipitation. And um, let me remind you where we are in the reservoir. We are going to be dissolving here, precipitating here, or in other forms of injection, as I, as I will describe. Remember that all this is pH dependent because every, every mineral, if you bury mineral, if you dump mineral in water and you close it from the top so there is no CO2 from the atmosphere, that water will reach an equilibrium pH with that mineral, which is its buffering capacity, and that's the one that it likes. At that point, it doesn't dissolve anymore. You take it out of that equilibrium condition and it will either dissolve or precipitate the new phase. And that is what this is showing you, that you're going to change solubility dramatically with pH. And when we inject CO2 underground, we change the pH. In fact, we tend to acidify quite extensively. And then this is what happens when you inject it into a fracture. This is a planar fracture. And now I'm injecting it, I'm tracking, I'm doing all the mass conservations and uh, uh, I'm satisfying uh, uh, um, uh, all equilibrium conditions, etc. And depending now on the rate of injection and the reactivity, something called the dan Holler number, and the rate of diffusion with respect to the rate of advection, which is called the Peckler number, the evolution of the fracture surfaces is going to be different. And so I may inject uh, uh, um, very slowly and I will dissolve primarily at the entry, like creating a funnel, or I can inject very fast and I will create a more homogeneous dissolution along the way. And in fact, now we measure this experimentally. One of our uh, uh, team members, Rashid Rashid, has done beautiful tests on this, uh, complemented with numerical simulations. All I would like to say, highlight here is to say, that this is an inherently hydrochemical coupling process and, and we need to recognize the complexity of that inter interaction. And now we can scale these results to a whole fracture network using uh, fracture networks or, 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 or uh, network models and you can see how uh, it gets to localize, the dissolution gets localized typically, for example, in karst terrains. If you have been in these huge caves underground with the stalactites and stalagmites, then most likely you have been in a dissolution cavern that has formed by localized dissolution along a channel. This may also happen in the subsurface when we inject CO2. Another thing that happens when we inject CO2 is that blocks of rocks or sediments are going to contract. And when that happens, the state of stress is going to change dramatically. And we know that that has happened in nature because you see all these discontinuities here in marine seismic data. These are called polygonal faults. These are features that have resulted from mineral dissolution in the seafloor. I'm going to jump this one to say a few things about precipitation and I apologize, I'm stretching this. So now uh, precipitation is a very important component. Uh, dissolution is the, is the scary part, precipitation is the savior, so, so let's pay a little bit of attention to this one. Um, look, this is a, a water droplet with salt as it precipitates on a hydrophilic surface the water likes the surface, it's on a hydrophobic surface, the water doesn't like it, so all the grains converge. So whether we are causing precipitation in pre-existing hydrocarbon reservoirs, which may be all wet, or we're going to do it in basalt, the pattern, the poor, the poor behavior uh, of uh, uh, the poor habit of precipitation will be dramatically different and will affect all the properties accordingly. The today's uh, uh, highlight of uh, mineralization, trapping carbon in a solid substance, so it really remains there for a long time, is uh, mineralization in basalts, for example, the, led by uh, the Iceland project called Carbfix. If you have participated in the seminar yesterday, it was wonderful. There is a part two coming up uh, where colleague Dr. Abu Dafifi will be presenting. Uh, please don't miss it. 
This is going to, is already a prototype in, in progress here in the kingdom, a major effort. It can have a tremendous impact to the world and to us in the kingdom. So pay attention. Very, very briefly, this is the idea. We capture the CO2 in a very cheap way by sprinkling water through CO2. And so that water dissolves the CO2 and gets fully loaded with it. Nitrogen doesn't dissolve so much, and so nitrogen gets automatically discarded. We inject that water, CO2, CO2 saturated water into the subformation. Remember that water with CO2 is heavier than the water in situ. Remember the tears. And so this nicely goes in, that is not buoyant. So we don't have problems with the cap rock. And then um, the CO2 is already trapped. Eh? And now the matter is, we, we want that to react with the, with the host rock to actually remineralize. And so it gets locked in in a solid form. Um, now, there is a problem. I'm making some calculations here that we won't have time much to, to, to describe, but let me just say that the problem with fractured rocks is that there are not enough fractures to have enough surface to interact with. And so when Carfix tells you that they are trapping between 100 and, and 200 kilograms, uh, excuse me, uh, 50 to 100 kilograms of CO2, which is equivalent to 100 to 200 kilograms of CO, uh, calcium carbonate in basalt, you have to wonder, my goodness, that's a big amount per cubic meter. How is that happening? And furthermore, if I, if I think of a specific surface and the diffusion time, this should take at least, at least 10 years. And it should be much longer than that. This is a very general diffusion coefficient. And so, but they are observing this in a matter of months. What is happening? Furthermore, there is no evidence of passivation. Let me explain what that means. The reason why gold, why they have gold, doesn't get uh, completely destroyed by rust is because it does rust, but it creates its own layer that is protective. Most metals will do that, not iron, but uh, uh, pure iron, but most uh, the, the copper, for example. And that is a self-passivation, self-armoring. And so when you have a crystal and you coat it with a new mineral, then you cannot reach the internal anymore because that layer is shielding it. However, they don't see any sign of passivation. And so what is the cause of a sustained reaction and a positive feedback process that appears to make this a very valuable alternative? Because if that happens now, uh, and this was highlighted by three of the speakers yesterday, the original IPPC, IPCC diagram where the idea is mineral trapping, but so difficult to, to reach in thousands of years, actually can happen in less than one year. And that's a, mi a miracle in the making, if you have enough water. So what do I think is happening? Folks, every time a crystal precipitates, it creates what is called a crystallization pressure, almost like capillary pressure. Those crystallization pressures can be quite high. Just a simple sodium chloride crystal, the one that we put on, the, on our food, it can create 200 megapascals of pressure. And basalt has only one, two, three megapascals of tensile strength. So if these crystals begin getting in and begin getting into the structure and begin breaking it, they have the power of breaking it and creating more surface and creating a self-feeding mechanism. We know that that happens, for example, in anhydride conversion to gypsum and the level of uh, engineering scales. And it's so powerful that if I put a, a, a sandstone in core on top of brine and I let it evaporate, brine goes up, precipitates the salt and the salt completely destroys the sandstone. We know that also when, when ice freezes and when it forms ice lenses or and if you walk around Kaust, you will see some beautiful examples. Uh, geologists may correct me for this, but they appear to be some of these mechanisms in place. And by the way, it's not just the surface. You see that oxidation is invading, similar to the patterns I showed before for acidification. And in some cases, it forms these beautiful bands. This is in front of the Italian restaurant. Go and take a look at that rock. It's just beautiful. These are called Lissagang bands. They are clear signs of diffusion reaction processes. I think that I am just going to show one more slide. This was the mineralization in solids. I also say that you can, if you are at this 
temperature and this pressure, you can also form hydrates. And in fact, you can take methane hydrates. This is a cage of water, the clathrate, with a CH4 molecule at the center. And now, if in the presence of CO2, the cage opens up like a flower, it's continuously vibrating, opens up, releases the CH4 and captures the CO2 because it's energetically advantageous. And in fact, it releases heat in so doing. And so there is a possibility that if we have methane hydrates, not around the kingdom, but in many parts of the world, we can inject CO2, we, we, we will be trapped, we may recover the CH4, it's still a fossil fuel, but it makes it much more, much more uh, um, um, uh, environmentally friendly. I think that I have run out of time and I don't want to push any further. I wanted to discuss about seal capacity because seals will be everywhere and the effect of clays. But let me close with this slide saying, uh, 10 years ago when we started this, there was a criterion that this was a Faustian bargain. In other words, a pact with the devil. We bury the CO2 today, uh, hopefully it won't leak before we die. And so who cares? Well, I think that there is, uh, if we're going to do it, we have to do it in a reliable way. Uh, going for solid forms of uh, capturing is clearly the most long term. But we don't need 100,000 years like for uh, radioactive waste. So we have to reconsider our state of mind. Please, if there is something that you're going to remember from this presentation, there are complex thermo, hydro, chemo, mechanical coupled processes. And whenever you have these couplings, emergent phenomena come out that you did not anticipate. And that's a concern. Well, we don't know that we don't know is still the, 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 the question mark for CO2 geological storage. But we don't have a chance. We don't have a choice. We have to, we have to make it happen and we have to take the risk and begin advancing. Um, I would like to conclude by saying that I'm very grateful to wonderful minds that uh, have worked together uh, on this project and to all of you for being here today and listening to this presentation. There should be a second part, uh, probably next year, when we advance and hence our recovery with CO2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's clear that uh, it's not just uh, about pumping the CO2 back and that's over. <laughs> it's much more complicated than that. And I will not, never look again uh, in, with the same eyes on these stones around the coast. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Okay, we so have we, have a, yeah, we have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, a specialist question. So if you also can have a look in the Q&A box and uh, uh, answer some of these. Uh, injection of CO2 in geothermal uh, reservoirs. Um, and the, and the issue here is that uh, uh, whether it's dry rock or not, because as soon as we go into high temperature with CO2 in the presence of water, if there is no water, basically this will be quite inert. These are all biomediated processes. Hmm? Uh, excuse me, biomediated, uh, water mediated processes. Uh, so, um, uh, I think that you're going to have, uh, probably you're planning to inject it in liquid form to, to get it out in, in gas form, which you benefit from all the, uh, the, the, the heat of transformation. Um, uh, keep an eye on the water. Hmm? Uh, question two, uh, do you know what danger CO2 gas leaks could pose? Uh, of course, uh, CO2 leaks are, uh, are very bad. There are lots of examples. The one in, in, in Africa that killed a whole town when, when came out of a lake to cases where pipes have uh, broken and uh, people have asphyxiated and animals. Um, so this is indeed, uh, and, and you know, it has no smell, so, so you don't detect it. So it is indeed something to, uh, to be cautious of. Uh, the same is with methane. That's the reason why we put the, the tinge gas in methane so we can smell it in the kitchen if there is a leak. Mm -hmm. And probably there may be alternatives like that, but um, uh, be careful. And for those of us who are working in the lab, we have to be careful as well. 
If we inject CO2 in supercritical condition in my limestone reservoir, can the acidity of CO2 behavior play a role like acidizing, which means increasing the pore? Yes, indeed, that will happen. Uh, uh, so the question is, uh, you inject CO2, you have water in the reservoir, CO2 will acidize the, 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 the water. Uh, acidic water will uh, dissolve uh, uh, the carbonate. And so you have to do your mass balances to see the extent of that. Um, and so always think that at some point of your injection, you're acidifying and somewhere else you're precipitating. So most likely you're going to be dissolving at the entrance unless you dry it completely, but you're going to cause, in, cause more dissolution near the inlet well and precipitation further out. So keep the two scenarios. It's, a, it's like the yin yang, eh? they are always together. Um, Next one, I'm interested uh, heterogeneous crystallization images from. These heterogeneous crystallization images, uh, uh, um, I think I showed, oh yes, yeah, those are our own, our own. Eh? Uh, and uh, we have a uh, increase if you, if you send me an, an email, I'll, I'll reply to you. I have a question about geological structures of reservoirs. We are considering that we can apply the same processes of CO2 storage in all reservoirs Mm -hmm. uh, how much CO2 can be stored on average? Well, uh, think of the size of your reservoir. Um, we talked a lot about uh, 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 viscous invasion, but as if, if it is a, 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 a trap, like an anticline, the CO2 will rise to the top and displace any other fluid down, uh, heavier fluid down, and the degree of saturation, at this point, don't think of viscous fingering anymore. That is when it is advective control. Once it reaches the top and is in equilibrium, uh, it will displace. And uh, you have to think of uh, Van Genuchen or Bruce Corey uh, uh, saturation versus capillary curves. And that will tell you uh, how much of the porosity you are going to, to make available for the CO2 at the given column height of CO2, which will give you the capillary pressure. I'll be happy to discuss all this further with all of you. Don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, from 4 billion to 1 billion years ago, CO2 was reduced by microorganisms. Can we grow these kind of microorganisms in huge numbers in order to reduce CO2? Yes, of course, and that is, that is continuously happening. Eh? Uh, uh, all the, the absorption of CO2 in, in the oceans today and in nature, is thanks to the bioactivity. Uh, that's the reason why it's so important to, to keep trees and then uh, uh, the huge fires that are taking place in, in California and Oregon uh, uh, for the last few weeks are releasing all that captured CO2 into the atmosphere, hopefully to recreate itself and to recapture it, but uh, um, uh, when, if that would get buried, then it would be permanently captured. Uh, microorganisms that are capturing, that capture CO2 in carbonates uh, that you have uh, Professor Volker van der Kamp in our group is studying this in great detail. Uh, um, uh, so in the Rabbit Lagoon and all around here is doing that in real time today. And yes, we can do it hopefully uh, and in industrial processes. Okay, uh, I, uh, I thank you, Sunil. I will keep that one between us. Uh, Piwi, uh, how important is the role of heterogeneous catalysis in the capture of CO2 or CO2 uh, valorization? Uh, Piwi, I am sure that you know the answer much better than I do because I know nothing about it. So, uh, and if you don't, please talk to Jorge Gascon. He is so persuasive and so enthusiastic about the possibilities there and that I think that uh, it gives uh, tremendous opportunities. So please uh, uh, do talk to him. There is one interesting question about uh, given the political and social situation regarding climate change, the infrastructure needed for uh, carbon sequestration and capture methods, uh, what it must come from private or state-driven uh, investment? This yes, um, mm, uh, that, that is a very good question, uh, probably beyond my, 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 my expertise, but there is a problem here. There is an inherent problem in, in the climate uh, issue. Uh, 
The climate issue has, and you may have seen charts uh, in the past similar to what I'm going to say, uh, we're talking about uh, thousands, millions of years. Uh, the political cycle is four years long. And um, there is such a mismatch between the political cycle, the engineering cycles, and the climate cycles. There is such a time mismatch that really creates problems. So, folks, uh, I really believe in great leaders. I really do. Eh? They have changed the world eh? and think and look into history. But I, uh, but I really believe in us, uh, in this group that gets together to think about sustainability. I really believe in us being the, the ones who carry the, the flame and maintain it alive, the flame of keeping this world healthy, not only for us, but for the generations to come. And so um, all, all of you guys, when I left the US five years ago, there was not one engineer in the Senate, not one. Decisions are being made by lawyers and politicians. These are the most dramatic decisions in the history of humankind. So let's get involved. And uh, let's don't blame it on politicians. Let's get involved uh, and um, decisively. Uh, it is the time of our lives to make it happen. I think that on that note, I am so yeah, grateful to all of you. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much for your time and for uh, all the discussion. It was very nice to have you today here. And uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, sorry for others that we didn't uh, answer the questions. Uh, please feel free to contact 